All right, guys, another fantastic guest on the Sad Truth. I've got Greg, Greg Gutfeld from Fox here with us, and we'll talk about why he works at such a Nazi propaganda network in a few seconds. Uh, he is the host of the Greg Gutfeld Show on Fox. He's also one of the five co-panelists on The Five, also running on Fox. Uh, many books, let me list them because you should probably read all of them. The Scoreboard, the official point system for keeping sport, score in the relationship game that's almost 20 years old. The Scorecard at Work, the official point system for keeping sport, score on the job. Boy, you keep a lot of scores. Lessons <laughs> from the Land of Pork Scratchings, the Bible of Unspeakable Truths, the sad truth being one of them. Uh, the Joy of Hate, How to Triumph Over Whiners in the Age of Phony Outrage. I love that title. Not Cool, The Hipster Elite and Their War on You. And finally, the most recent one, How to Be Right, The Art of Being Persuasively Correct. How are you doing, sir? I'm doing great. Good to hear from you. Like, uh, just sitting here in the rain in New York. <laughs> you know, oftentimes people write to me and say, how do you meet all these people? What kind of network do you have? And so I, I thought I would actually start by explaining how we met and link it to an, a scientific phenomenon. So you and I originally met because you had very kindly chosen one of my books, The Consuming Instinct, as one of your favorite books. Uh, if you wish to add more compliments later, please feel free to do so. Absolutely. <laughs> one of those, uh, uh, it's one of those books that, uh, you know, I worked in health journalism for a long time at Men's Health and Prevention Magazine. And I was taught that you always should have like a hot spot in every paragraph. So there's like a little fact in there that go, that makes you go, wow, like the fact that an M&M, you know, if you eat one M&M, you have to walk one city block so that you will never forget that fact because it's right. so mind blowing. What I liked about your book was that uh, almost like every paragraph had something in there that you have to underline, like, you know, the, the stuff about uh, sun tanning right. or the stuff about gay, like the, the sex differences in weird behaviors. Like, this is great stuff. And then you can actually use it to apply to, uh, to service journalism. Like you could say, here's what you should do. And that's I, I did that through the 90s with, you know, evolutionary biology and psychology. I would put that in men's health rather than interview typical self-help doctors. I would look at stuff by, you know, I think David Buss and Helen Fisher use that stuff instead and interview her for my stories because I always found that that's where the where the real information is. You know, it's funny that, that you mentioned sense. these two people. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Uh, Helen Fisher uh, was one of the endorsers of the Consuming Instinct, and David Buss wrote the foreword to the Consuming Instinct. So you're you're smack on in terms of the great experts. I have a great Helen Fisher story. Do you know that Helen Fisher and I went to hedonism together? Uh, hedonism is that mind blowing? Is, is that true? Yes. Wow, that this is, is this is in I Jamaica, was, I did, right? I did a picture. What you're, you're breaking it's like up a, a bit. half dude. Pardon me. You're breaking up a bit. You're breaking up your connect the connection. Uh, I don't know what. Oh, ah, uh, damn it. Um, I can still hear you. Okay, go but, on. Uh, let's, let's go on and let's see what happens. All right. Well, anyway, uh, when I worked at Men's Health, I had this idea called the Wild Kingdom, where I would go to a swingers resort with an anthropologist, and we treat it like it was an like a safari. Or like a wild, the Wild Kingdom, where you watch the animals, you know, how the, their mating rituals and stuff like that. And I think I, I contacted a couple of anthropologists, and they were like, "No thanks," but they kept saying, "You got to go to Al, you got to talk to Ellen Fisher, Ellen Fisher." And I had read one of her books, which I think was Anatomy of Love or yes, something like yes. that. And uh, so I met her at a bar, like a, a, in the Upper East Side. She brought a, a man with her to make sure I wasn't a freak, <laughs> and uh, and we made a little contract on a on a paper napkin. That we swore that whatever would happen there was like, you know, we wouldn't talk about it afterwards. And then we went and we went to hedonism and it would turn out to be a great piece. She would we would go to the swimming pools and and to the clubs where people were picking up and she would just give ongoing commentary. And I would write it down while talking to women. It was an amazing uh, experience. And we had a blast. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. She was uh, something else. Yeah. She's I've lovely. Had on, uh, I've had her on my show a couple of times. She's just brilliant. I'm, I'm assuming that. The wave of invitations from your show that are directed at me have just been lost in the mail or somehow yes. I haven't yeah. gotten them in the email because that, that's the you only know, rational. You know, there's so many gad sads out there. <laughs> so I'm sure there's one in, in – uh, I think there's one in Israel right now or Egypt who's like getting all the invites. There you go. Uh, so, so to continue of how we met, so then because of your gracious uh, endorsement of my book, we connected on Twitter. And here we are now having a chat when we probably would have never had an opportunity to meet one another. And now I'd like to link that to a phenomenon mm -hmm. called the small world phenomenon, which some people might have heard of it. The idea that as long as you, you, you don't include closed societies 
we could link any two people anywhere in the world through fewer than six links. And now with right. social media, you could even probably reduce that number from lower to, than six, right? So that guys like you and I, who otherwise operate in completely dis- different spheres, can meet and get to know one another, right? I agree. In fact, you know, it's, it's when people say it's a small world, they're, they're right and wrong. Like when you're in the, if, if you're in the airport and you run into somebody that you haven't seen and, and you go, oh my God, I can't believe, actually it makes perfect sense because chances are if you are similar, you're trafficking or traveling in the same world. So it may it may seem like the world is this massive place with six billion people, but actually you're only seeing the same thousand, right? right Does that right. make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, incidentally, speaking of the small world, I recently had, I'm sure you know him uh, because he, he often appears on Fox and he has a Fox show with Anthony Scar, uh, Scaramucci. Oh, um, yeah. And uh, and now apparently he's he's been slated or he's been invited to be on Trump's transition team. So now I can say that I okay. am only two degrees removed from the grand devil himself, Donald Trump, which we should, well, yeah, go ahead. You don't need, you, you, I know Donald. Oh, so there you actually, go. So you I don't need to, Anthony. Yeah, you're, you're, so you're basically, you don't need Anthony. Yeah, no, <laughs> uh, President-elect Trump used to call me after my red eye shows because he, he's up all night. So we would watch red eye, which is on at like 3 a.m. in New York. <laughs> he would call me and he knew everything about the show. I'm talking about the last three or four years. He, would, he called me like two or three times. Then I did a speech in Florida and and spent a lot of time with him there and uh, got to know him. I think he's a little bit – he's probably miffed that I, was, uh, I wasn't I was a cheerleader. Right. Like I, I, I believe that you have to be – if you like somebody, you got to be critical because you want them to be – you want them to up their game. But I think he wasn't used to – I think he was used to people being complimentary and I wasn't – one of the people, you know, cheerleading, you know, leading the parade. I was, I was, you know, whenever he screwed up, I said, you screwed up. You so would tell, he, might would, still hate, he might hate me now. You would tell him this in, uh, as you're speaking to him or on your show that he screwed up? Um, on, uh, we never spoke. Oh, I after, he, he did my show and I asked, and, and I, it was right before he declared and I said, are you going to run for president? And I said, you should run for president. It's going to be awesome. And then we talked about how I would be his press secretary and then that was the last time we spoke. And then he made that comment about uh, uh, when he was walking down the when he walked down the escalator and made that uh, mistake right. about talking about Mexico. And I, you know, I said, you know, my theory, and I, it's 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 not my theory. It's a lot of people's theories is that when you have a sound idea, it always bums you out when somebody kind of pees in that pool. Like they take one of your ideas and then they because they screw it up, it makes the whole idea bad. So it's like you may be for infor- tough borders and more uh, stricter immigration, but when somebody says they're bringing the rape, it, it goes, no, 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 no. That's not how you articulate it. There's by, a better by, way to say this. By the way, so, th- this happens in my scientific work because uh, evolutionary theory in general, biology in general, Darwinian theory, because it has been uh, usurped by all sorts of nefarious groups like the Nazis to justify right. their actions or eugenicists or social class elitists, suddenly all the social scientists hate evolutionary theory because it's right. the work of the devil, when of course it has absolutely nothing to do with that. So it's exactly what you're saying. Uh, yeah, in fact, I mean, like you can't, there's certain things that you can't talk about, any kind of differences, whether it's sex or race, because it's already been co opted by a really grotesque group of people. And that happens even with like with immigration, you know, you can't, you, you can't talk about, you know, practical solutions for anything because you'll say, well, you're just part of that evil group. And, and um, so that's my, my, my criticism was that, that uh, uh, President like Trump played fast and loose with certain kinds of ideas, even though his heart might've been in the right place, his mouth often wasn't. Right. So I was always like, can't you just say it a little bit better? Right. Say it better. Yeah, look, so. look, packaging matters, right? I mean, I talk about, uh, here's a, an example of a very small study, but that captures the idea of packaging. You could take the exact same product, basketball, uh, athletic socks, put them in a fancy package or a non-fancy package, ask people mm-hmm. to try them out. Even though it's the exact same product, people will infer right. much higher quality to the, one, to the one that's in the fancy package. So take Donald Trump, improve some of his sort of linguistic fluidity, uh, and then suddenly he might become less nefarious and less of a Nazi, right? Yeah, and then he might not be as popular because he tells it like it is. That's the issue. That's why I, you know, I always, I'm always open to being incorrect. Like, what if he took my advice and lost? 
<laughs> you know, because because he decided to speak like a, a, a you know more sophisticated person rather than connect. And and let's face it, he connected. So it's like he he was probably wise to ignore me. Uh, a lot of people are wise to ignore me. So what do you what do you think? Are I mean, I guess there's a confluence of forces that led to him uh, being elected. Uh, of course, the rejection of political correctness, the rejection yeah. of identity politics, the fact that he speaks in a in a in a you know. Uh, regular manner that's not part of the sort of the elite class. Uh, what are some other factors that you think that led to his incredible victory? I think th the first three things you said are are the, the the stool. That's the thing. Not literally, but the actual table, the, the legs of the stool. <laughs> the other thing is, and I, I talked about this when he started, when Senator Obama ran, he had a he had the historical bubble. You know, he you know he he uh Lacked the experience that, you know, Senator McCain had, but it didn't matter because he was the first. He's going to be the first African-American. He had this kind of like historical <laughs> bubble. Um, Trump had a historical bubble as an entertainer that this was the first time somebody could go out and say things. And then somebody go, oh, it's just Trump. It's a, don't. Oh, no, he does. He's a TV guy. He can say that stuff. So when he makes it like the, when he made when he makes jokes about Rosie O'Donnell or what everybody goes, it's like you're it's like, oh, that Donald. We had a segment called, uh, uh, I think that I think it was called Oh That Donald. And it was like he would say things and you just go, you know, he can do that. And so I think he was – what he did, which was he's like the spear, that the, the, the tip of the spear that kind of like punctured the PC movement. He allowed other people to start saying things. And I think the good part about it is, you know, people are now uh, distinguishing language from act, Right. you know? which is really important because we've kind of conflated the two in the last 20 or 30 years. Saying something is, is, is no longer the same as doing something. So he's shown that. He, I mean, and he's upset me and I've had to learn how to like, oh, hey, these are just words. They're just words, Greg, you know, I because I've been arguing about that forever. It's like, you, you know, words don't matter. But, you know, uh, so that positive, uh, the positive thing is that people can now feel free to speak and maybe that will affect the campuses. Right. Where they ban speakers and where com – like comedians. There's so many comedians that are upset about Trump, yet they've been voicing the same issues about – like there are comedians who say they don't want to go on campus anymore because they're worried about their material causing problems. You should thank Trump because he's he's helping to, to deflate that problem. Now, the bad side is railing against the politically correct doesn't mean you could be an asshole, of course. right? Of course. Yeah. So they go, it goes back to the original point, the uh, peeing in the pool of rhetoric. Right. You know, all of a sudden you have somebody else who's, who's saying, you know, I'm with you, but you don't want to be with that person, right. whoever he is. But so speak, it's, speaking about the comedians, uh, I mean, you're highlighting there a something that I criticize amongst the castrated class or the faux liberals, as I call them. Uh, they're, they're incredible. They're stifling moral hypocrisy and sense of false equivalences. And I actually, I recently released on you know my, my channel, uh, a Sad Truth, where I exactly spoke of this. And let me repeat it here and then get your mm -hmm. reaction. So for example, I will post endless stuff regarding the, the just innumerable cases of genocidal mayhem that is imparted on the world globally by one mm -hmm. ideology. Shh, we won't say what it is, right? All mm -hmm. of my academic colleagues, right? I mean, I live in the viper's den of political correctness, right? Uh, so for me, for example, to have preferred Trump over Hillary Clinton, I must right. have been some some devil unicorn, right? But in right. any case, uh, I, t I said basically, here's what happens to all of the, the faux liberals. They are perfectly quiet when, ex when exposed to just profound, grotesque, uh, attacks on human dignity. But mm -hmm. when they hear that a friend of a friend told a janitor who knew a cousin that there is three three white guys in a pickup truck who hurled an insult at an apparent immigrant and this was caused by Trump uh, because of the new Trump reality, they all get on Facebook and they are outraged and they right. are incensed and they are so, 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 so afraid to go buy tomatoes because a new... Uh, era of darkness has been ushered by Trump. And I despise this moral hypocrisy. What are your thoughts I think, on that? I think that, well, part of it is they're, they are lazy. Right. It's easy to express this uh, outrage. They don't even bother to look up to see if it's true. Like right now, there's I've, I've read three or four examples 
uh, in the media, people talking about hate crimes that have been caused by the exactly what you said, Trump's election. We know because you've done the research. We've all looked at this. I've written about it. A lot of these things turn out to be hoaxes by people seeking attention. They're like volunteer firemen who set fires. <laughs> so there'll be, you know, there'll be a guy that um, says somebody wrote this on my dorm door, like uh, a, a SWAT sticker, or they'll put a noose. And they always find out after three days of investigation and a tearful confession in a room. And the first thing they do, the left does is, well, that incident might not be true. But you know it's true somewhere else. So I think we've learned and raised awareness by this act that never took place. That's what gets me. It's like it's like they it gets me out. It's like so it doesn't. You're telling me that it matters when it happens and it matters when it doesn't happen. So that means. So even the scam is a teachable moment, basically. The scam is a teachable moment. It's 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 amazing. By the way, I after you said Devil Unicorn, that's going to be the name of my metal band. I want but royalties. I, Yes, yes, absolutely. But uh, so to your point, there's a laziness. It's easy to to express outrage if you don't have to do anything about it. For example, if you want to know about the atrocities in the Middle East, you're going to have to read about it. And also, you've got to be brave enough to bring it up into conversation when somebody else is doing it. And that's a lot of work, too. All of this requires work. If you look at like you know, I know that you've been on Sam Harris's uh, podcast, but like Sam Harris has, has endured slings and arrows for what? For kind of just speaking common sense right. about the, you know, the, the violence uh, uh, in Islam. And he's like, you know, nobody wants to nobody wants to pay that price. And they look and they and they look at other people paying that price and they go, I'm glad that's not me. Well, you know, I don't want to be threatened all, all the time. I don't want to lose speaking gigs. That's what people are thinking. But you know what? Eventually, the the dark wave is going to catch up to you. And so that's what I try to compel people to do. I say, look, I, I, I take great personal and professional risks for what I do, right? Mm -hmm. And yet I do it because I simply can't put down my head on my pillow at the end of the day knowing that I could have done some something. However right. small voice that I may have, yeah. I'm doing my part and I would feel like a coward and a fraud if I said, well, you know, it's not for me to do it. I, I receive often uh, personal, mm -hmm. uh, private messages from people, so many times academics, who say, my right. God, you're, you're my hero, you're so courageous, I wish I had the courage. And I say, listen, if you don't have the courage to do so now, as things are going, you're going to have lesser and lesser window of yeah. opportunity to speak. So, so, you know, grow a pair and start speaking when you still have the chance. Are you there? Are you there? Me? Sorry. Yeah, I'm here. I'm here. I you're, think I'm here. It's much. Yeah, you're 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 breaking up. I don't know what's going on. Oh, okay. Now you're good. Can you, uh, speak? you sound perfectly fine. Okay. Keep, yeah. Keep it could just be the fact that the weather sucks. Okay. Yeah, but anyway, no. I would say that in, maybe in this new era, w people can actually be more free to speak about what is going on uh, right now on this planet. That there's a pernicious, you know, toxic doctrine, you know, call it radical Islam that is like, you know, that is, you know, that wants, I mean, I, that I'm, I'm worried about that in artificial intelligence and I don't know which one's worse yet. <laughs> I, I don't know. I, I, I wake at night and I go like artificial intelligence. Gonna be, we're going to be slaves to, to artificial intelligence in 10 years. And then I think about radical Islam and I think about all it takes is one nefarious agent to get a dirty bomb. And so I keep going back and forth. I'm not sure which one's worse yet. But, but by the way, and if you watched, uh, if you listened to my chat with Sam Harris, uh, one of the things that I tried to point out to him is that people have a, in my view, an incorrect uh, understanding of the dangers that are posed by this ideology because they think in a very short term window, right? Uh, right? What will happen if we let in refugees in terms of having an increased likelihood of a terrorist attack or the example that you gave with the dirty bomb? But there's a there's a longer window threat, and that is that as there is an, a shift in demographic realities, as a society becomes more Islamized, uh, then freedoms go out the window. I mean, that's right. about as clear as the existence of gravity. So sure, we could look at what happens if we let in 50,000, 100,000 Syrians tomorrow, and can we vet them or not? And that's a very important issue. But the more general question is, what happens when the fabric of our Western values are altered when you let in people, many of whom don't share any of those values. And so I actually think that in the long-term perspective, that's a greater danger. Right. Yeah, it's an interesting, um, and you would know the word for this, 
it, 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 it's not like a contradiction, but we, you know, the argument is we should be welcoming in people who wish to dis- who, who wish to replace the culture that is welcoming. Yeah, well, I, I, I call it I call I call this part of the ostrich castrati brigade, right? Uh, ostrich in that the metaphor is that you put your head in the sand and you deny right. and and castrati is because you are completely a coward without any testicular fortitude combine these two together and you come up with people who are perfectly parasitized even in terms of having a survival instinct to protect themselves right you know uh, you you brought up uh, or I did first the podcast with Harris what I liked about that uh, and I and I mentioned it you know because it's something in my head and it goes back to this is that I think it was asking you about Trump, right? And right. you said that that people, if they if they have one issue, yes, that is extremely important to them, um, that that issue should uh, kind of allow you to dismiss, not dismiss, but kind of push the other stuff that might be disagreeable to the side. And I thought that was a very clear way of putting it. That, like, you know, Thank it's okay. You. My number one thing is is like, how do we deal with the threat of radical Islam? And maybe, you know, maybe Trump's language. I'm not crazy about it. But weighing those two things, exactly. I think I can deal with a few of his crude remarks, right? Well, and- that, was a, that was an interesting thing. But then I listened, I don't know if you listened to the podcast. This I thought was hilarious. And uh, Sam Harris with Andrew Sullivan. Oh, no, I, tr- I, I specifically try to avoid those conversations because it will increase my blood pressure. My physician oh, no, said you- I need to control my blood pressure. You had to, it was it, what was interesting about it was Sam Harris and the two smart people talking about how Hillary Clinton is preferable to Donald Trump. And it was about a two and a half hour podcast. But during it, they began by going over the problems of Hillary Clinton so that halfway through the podcast, anybody who wasn't going to vote for Trump was. It was like they, <laughs> they go now before we now before we go before we could condemn Mr. Trump. Let's go through all of the problems with Hillary Clinton. And Andrew Sullivan spent an hour destroying Hillary Clinton. And then at the middle, it was like, I think even even Sam Harris said, you know, wow, I think um, I think I think maybe we need I think we've we might have convinced people. <laughs> maybe she's the best because it did to me. I'm like, listen, I'm going like, wow, Andrew Sullivan just convinced me not to vote for Hillary Clinton. You know, not that I was. Right. But it was like he just went through everything. And then they got to they got to Trump. But it was I thought it was a really I think Andrew Sullivan was so hysterical about it that, you know, it's not true. It reminded me of 1980. I was 16 when Ronald Reagan was elected and I was living in California <laughs> and they the people there were freaking out that, you know, oh, my God, this horrible dictator. He was a terrible governor. Actually, it was OK. And but there were everybody was freaking out and then nothing happened. Well, nothing happened. The, this, like this full fear is so obnoxious and I yeah. and again not to sort of use my personal history to sort of beat down people with their stupidity but it's relevant so what you know we yeah. we left Lebanon uh, we escaped execution in Lebanon my parents were kidnapped uh, in Lebanon we went I mean whatever you see with Isis is what I grew up with in Lebanon right. and I escaped from so then you 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 know juxtapose that to the endless fear that people are I mean I, I mean, literally, the, the the first three or four days on my personal Facebook feed of academics who are sharing sort of firsthand account of how afraid they are. And they would always right. start with sort of some identity politics. I am a woman from India, and sort of this is why I am now afraid to go and buy tomatoes at the grocery store. I just thought that it was so extraordinarily fake. I mean, such yeah. a form of collective, oh. you know, paranoia that it was almost laughable. Yeah, well, I got to tell you, speaking of fake, so Tuesday night, I'm, I do the five, and then I do a hit with the uh, FNC with election headquarters. I walk to this bar, because I got to be there for four hours. The doorman there recognizes me, really a tall, in a suit, Jamaican guy, goes, tell me, is is Trump going to win? Trim, Trump must win. Trump must win. Uh, if, if Trump loses, America is no longer the leader of the free world. And I'm like, going, oh, wow. And so I go, I got, I look at my phone. I got this, uh, this New York times gauge that shows you, and it's got 90% Hillary's going to win. And I go, dude, look at this. And he's like, oh, and he's like crushed. And then I go into the bar, I sit down and I see the gauge moving and it's freaking everybody. It's like, you're watching people in the bar going, holy crap. 
now it's 60 percent. Now, it's, so I go outside and I go up to him and I go, hey, man, I think I jumped the gun. You know, I think that it still looks like Hillary's going to win, but it's changing. And he's like, oh, Greg, this is great. But the, about the fake thing, I'm, we're out there, right? I won't say what we're doing, but I'm outside. But anyway, we're, we're <laughs> two tourists walk by, uh, Brits. And, you know, they're in their they're middle age. They look like they're dressed the way they'd be dressed in their 20s, but they're middle aged. Uh, they look like they've been walking around Times Square. And they come up to me and they, they go, excuse me. Uh, the, man, the man goes, excuse me. Would you know the results yet of, of who's winning? And I go, well, it looks to me like Hillary is ahead. And he just jumps in the air and he goes, yes, yes. And then they hug and, I'm, and it was like so ostentatious, so phony. It was, like a, it was like an appeasement signal because they thought, oh, I'm in New York City. They'll be happy that I'm doing this. And it's like, and it was great because the doorman just stared at them stoic and just with a grim face. And so they, they were like looking at us and we were just like staring. And they just kind of like looked and they go, so is this a bar? And he goes, yes, it's a bar. And they just kind of like, they kind of scurry away to Times Square, but they realized they thought that, that, you know what it is. It's the assumption that you run into on campuses. It's the assumption you run into in publishing companies that you can display obnoxiously your views, your left-wing views, your liberal views, because everybody around you feels the same way. Meanwhile, the people that are quiet just have to sit there and take it. Well, that and, was like a microcosm. And so let, me, let, on the street. let me build on that. So I see what many of my colleagues post regarding Trump and so on, right? And I, I mean, it, it is so, I mean, genuinely offensive. It is so intolerant of the possibility that someone who might be on their feed might actually hold a different position. I mean, they literally, I mean, you talk about, I hate that word that the, the faux liberals use, the othering, right? I mean, you talk about yeah. othering, right? They, they will construct a reality, or at least they did prior to Trump's victory, whereby, I mean, only a degenerate, toothless, you know, uh, Appalachian man who rapes any, you know, hikers and who denies evolution and is part of the KKK could ever even for a moment entertain uh, the, the possibility that someone might prefer Trump. And then you mm -hmm. think about for someone who is so offended by everything, right? If you don't address somebody by their preferred gender pronoun, uh, uh, you, you go into a march and you're so outraged. But you don't, using sort of some non-broken moral compass, come to the conclusion that it might be inappropriate for you to be positing such things. Now, I happen to be somebody who luckily is endowed with very, very large testicles. And so I walk and I speak my mind and I don't care. But imagine all the other professors who may not love Hillary. Imagine all the students on campuses who might say, oh, but professor, can I offer you a possibility of something that I heard Gat Saad say on mm -hmm. Sam Harris's show regarding the lexicographic rule, which you mentioned earlier? That student would never say that. And right. that's, a, that's grotesque. That is an affront to the purpose of our educational system. And in a second, I'll ask you to comment, but I want to get back to your background at UC Berkeley, the headquarters of the, that bullshit. But comment on yeah. what I just said and then link it to your background at UC Berkeley. Well, you know, it's interesting because I was just going to go there. Uh, one of the encouraging things, I was, at the, I was at Hofstra for the presidential debate. I think it was the last one or it might have been the first one. It was the first one. That's the, so I'm there, we're doing a live five and there's all these kids, students, um, protest, not protesting, demonstrating, very positive for Hillary. But the weird thing that blew my mind was all of the Trump kids. And I'm thinking, I'm thinking back to 1983 at Berkeley, you ne there was no such thing as a conservative or Republican kid with his mouth open. His mouth was shut. And I'm looking at this and I'm watching these kids walking down the quad with signs going, uh, lock her up or whatever, whatever the, the slogan was. And it was fun. There was no violence. There was nothing. And I'm going, something's happening on campus. There is a rebellion against the PC hyper tolerant or intolerant movement. And this, and, and, and now they're not scared anymore. Now going back to Berkeley, like 80, I was a freshman in 83. I was very left wing. I worked at the, I, I guess not left wing. I guess I was a conventional teenager, which is the same thing as being a left winger because you have these romantic ideals that are untethered to consequence. You know, you think that all the money that you're getting 
comes from your dad's wallet and you don't know where that money comes from, that it actually comes from some others. You don't connect any dots. You only connect one dot, you. And, and, uh, and so I, was, uh, I worked for the nuclear freeze to get extra credit. That was in high school. So like if you got um, – for my relig- – this is for a religion class. You got a clipboard and you went to the churches and stood outside. And if you got signatures for this petition that would prevent nuclear weapons from being transported in California, you could get like – if you had a B- minus in religion class, you could get it up a half a grade to a B. If you got more signatures, you'd get a B plus. So this is perfect. Just one hour outside of St. Gregory's, which is my, my, my parish, I would just stand there and get signatures. So that's how that, so you're already, it's already ingrained that this works for you, that you can be rewarded for liberalism. I'm, that, that's in high school. I'm being rewarded for this. So when you get to campus, you understand that you're going to get rewarded by professors and whatnot. And so when I got there, that was where I saw it for real. And I didn't understand, like I never saw so many aggressive people. They had become complacent. They knew that they could do this. They knew they could shout at you. And I remember walking home from the library and there was some kind of, like there was a a protest or a march. And it was like a take back the night thing, something like that. And they started shouting at me. And I remember I was just walking, minding my own business, um, College Avenue. Let let me guess what it was before you go on. It's because you're a white male, therefore you are part of the patriarchy, yeah. therefore you are part of the mechanism that institutes the rape culture. Am I right? Yeah, yeah but I didn't see – I was so naive. I didn't even – I never – I probably never even heard of the word patriarchy. I was like a freshman in college. All I wanted was to get good grades and stay out of trouble. I, I never raised my hand. In, in class, I just like, you know, I come in with a hangover. Well, you've and, become yeah. a lot more vocal later in life. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Well, you know what happened? It was like, I go like, why are Why is everybody yelling at me? I didn't get it. And then you had the shanties being built on campus. Now, there was a legitimate protest going on about apartheid during that era. But then it got in, they were building shanty towns and then there were people living there. And then there were crimes being committed, assaults being committed on women by people that were like kind of interlopers, kind of like what happened with uh, Occupy Wall Street in Zuccotti Park, where people would get mugged or, or, or horrible things would happen because that's what happens when you when you when authority goes away, becomes anarchy. But somebody I don't know what happened, but I was like, well, what the hell is going on? I don't understand this. And a friend of mine gave me National Review and the American Spectator. These were and I ended up working at the American Spectator and writing for National Review. But um, there was actually funny stuff in there. And I didn't know that there was another point of view. Uh, there was a section called This Week in National Review, which had little snippets. And they were, they were about the absurdities of campus life. And I thought this was great. And then the American Spectator had something called Current Wisdom, where they just took out bits from liberal publications and just left them there with maybe a title or a blurb. And I'm, and I'm like going, wow, I go, there are actually people that are making fun of this stuff. I didn't know that existed. That was kind of the that was the open door that I walked through, and then I started reading, subscribing, and finding books. And then I took my internship at the National Journalism Center right when I graduated, which was kind of an internship program for conservatives in media. And then from there, I went to the American Spectator and made no money, you know, uh, eating hot dogs, living in a, in a in the basement of a house in Arlington, Virginia, with two elderly women. It was like it was like you, you were talking about you were starting at the bottom, and uh, but I, that's right. And it kind of was like I think I needed to see what it was like at Berkeley for me to have that right change take so place. I, I want to come back to the campus thing, but since you mentioned conservatives in media, I want to quote for you, to you a study which maybe you're familiar with. So let me just read it. It's a 2014 sure. study titled "The American Journalist in the Digital Age." It was conducted. Uh, by two then Indiana professors, I think one of them has now left the University of Kentucky, where they looked at the political affiliations of journalists, uh, I mean, mm-hmm. as, as, as uh, reported by themselves, right? right. Uh, uh, and 7% of reporters were Republican, but apparently right. there's no such thing as a liberal media bias. Four times as many Democrats, which only puts it at 28% for Democrats, the others being, quote, independent, which right. is another word for 
I am Wait. a Democrat, but I don't wish to admit it to you. Uh, yeah, yeah. So the bottom line, the only thing that you wish that you should take away from the study is that 7% of journalists are Republicans. But then when you tell the faux liberals that there might be some bias in the media, they say that's outrageous. Only a Breitbart Nazi would say something like that. Yeah. Well, it, 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 there's two points to make. Nowadays, if you are not a liberal, you're a rebel. I mean, it, it, it should be a badge of honor now. It should be the way Abby Hoffman was right. in the early 70s. You know, if you're, a, if you're a conservative on campus, you should be viewed as like the new Abby Hoffman. I used to say that Breitbart was like that for me. Um, but th these studies have been around. There was a study I remember that they looked at voting records and it was like 90 some odd percent voted Democrat. There was just that's it, there's no uniformity like this in any other profession. Like even in bank, like if you look at bankers, academia, all, academia, Democrats, academia has roughly the same ratios. So, for yeah. example, there's a study. Uh, sorry to interrupt you, but there there's no. a, there is a study that looked at uh, uh, political affiliations of professors at a bunch right. of universities. I often quote the study, and across disciplines, it was five to one. Democrats, right. which is bad enough, but now in all the social activism field and all the you know touchy feely fields, sociology yeah. and humanities and so on, sociology it was forty four to one the ratio. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I mean, again, now by the way, what, what if when I tell people these types of statistics, the, the the typical response from them, which is frankly laughable and grotesque, is that well, of course, journalists and professors are going to be uh, Democrats because they are smart and educated, right? right? So the only possibility, you having a different foreign policy perspective or a different fiscal policy perspective, which are not clear black and white issues, that is simply because you're an idiot. And so right. they just reaffirm their echo chambers and it's an impenetrable echo chamber. Yeah, and that's why they completely missed this election. Exactly. Like I, I, I would say in my in my circle of friends. I think I said this on the five. A third voted were voting Trump. A third was not going to vote for Trump. It could be Gary Johnson. A third might go Hillary. Um, and then I would say another third, but that would be four thirds. Uh, so a third in, within the third of not Trump, probably not voting maybe. Um, but because of that, I knew it was going to be close. And I knew that there's a possibility Trump would win. But if you talk to people that were uh, um, like the New York Times, they assumed it was going to be a blowout because they didn't know one single person that was for Trump. My sister and her husband uh, have had friends that are they live in California, have friends that are very liberal. They treat them like anomalies, like you like, you know, like your uh, 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 devil unicorn. They were so like everything's going to be Hillary's going to win big. So they treated them. They patronized them when Trump won the Facebook pages became so bitter and so angry. And the people that were for Trump, like my sister and her husband, weren't allowed to say anything. Right. They couldn't gloat because that would be wrong if they gloated. <laughs> However, if Hillary had won, it would have been perfectly OK right. for them to parade it around and put hearts on their Facebook pages and historical firsts and show the shattered glass ceiling, you know. But but in, so they so they lose. They that side loses and they are beyond themselves and they're they're in they're actually arguing and saying how did like blaming people like it's because of you the country is going to hell and it's like what happened what happened to the greater good what happened to you know the hearts in the right place what what happened to you people like this is the democratic system well you know i think so i'm gonna analogize what happened in terms of the echo chamber with something that happens with professors so oftentimes when professors receive their teaching evaluations at the end of the semester they're surprised that they didn't yeah. do as well as they did. And the reason right. for that is, is related to overconfidence that stems from this very, I, I hope you'll agree, insightful uh, observation. Mm -hmm. Only the students who thought you were great come up to you in your office and say, hey, right. Professor Saad, I really loved your course. I think it was great. And and so I only my brain only codes the seven students who came up to me and thought I was great. But any other student who thought that I was the devil unicorn didn't yeah. knock on my door and say, you know what, Professor Saad, you really suck. And therefore, yeah. I think that everybody loves me. But then I receive my teaching evaluations and I realize that there is a multiplicity of opinions of, about my performance. Well, this is yeah. exactly what happened in this election, right? Everybody mm -hmm. that all these 
castrated class speak to, Hillary Clinton is wonderful and we're going to have this collective orgasm when she wins, and only some hicks that we never interact with could possibly want the devil to win. And then right. they're, they're shocked, right? Because they never code that possibility. Yeah. And I mean, even I, you know, I... It was surprised. I just thought it was going to be close, but I thought she was going to she was going to squeak by. So that, I thought I thought he was going to win popular vote, and she was going to win the electoral college. I'm not sure what it, I'm not even sure what the the pop the popular vote is now. But I think I got it up. I mean, he won the electoral, and she was winning the popular vote. Right. I think, but I think I don't know if he actually overtook her. I don't know if he did. I can't. I I should look that up. Given that I go on TV and talk politics. <laughs> So let's let's go back to. Uh, I know that you have to leave by eleven, so I'm 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 being very careful with the time. Uh, let's go back to campuses and discuss yeah. some recent cases. Uh, maybe you you've heard of them. If not, I'll briefly summarize them and then we can go on. Uh, so there are a couple of cases that have recently come up where professors, uh, and of course I include myself in this, this packet, uh, you know, are fighting back against political correctness. Luckily for me, there haven't been any repercussions. Uh, but other professors have been suffering quite gravely. So there's a couple of cases. I'll mention two, a few cases. So Jordan Peterson, I don't know if you know this case. Are you familiar with it? No, but I, I, I'm sure I've read it, but I don't know the name. Okay, and then there's another one actually in your neck of the wood. Uh, uh, Michael, what is his name? Uh, Rechtenwald from NYU. So I thought I would mention both of them. So Jordan Peterson is a guy who's actually been on my show. He reached out to me and came on my show about a month ago. He's a University of Toronto professor of psychology uh, who basically decided that he was going to voice an opinion, thinking that you know Canada was a d democratic country with where freedom of speech is allowed. What an idiot for having thought that. Uh, he decided that he was going to weigh in as a professor, as an academic, as a citizen, against a tabled bill called uh, Bill C-16, whereby they were in incorporating gender expression and gender identity as separable group that are uh, amenable to hate crime, right? And, right? and he was demonstrating that the manner in which, never mind whether those groups should be included or not, he was arguing that the, the language of the bill was so vague, right? If you do something or don't do something, if you say something or don't say something, if it's intentional or unintentional, you could be uh, held... Right. Uh, you know, accountable. And so then he was called by the University of Toronto uh, in really an Orwellian move where they're saying, look, you have to stop saying this. And now he might potentially end up losing his job. He's a tenured professor who's very, very accomplished. So that's one. And I'll mention the other one very quickly and then I'll ask you to weigh in. And these, yeah. these certainly would be guys that would be great to come on your show. Uh, not that I wish to serve as their publicist. Uh, <laughs> because before they come, I think we both know who should be on your show on a yeah. regular basis. I, I we proved that point. <laughs> uh, Michael Rechtenwald is a guy at NYU who was uh, speaking out against the safe spaces and the microaggressions and the trigger warnings and so on. And then he, uh, NYU, came after him hard. Now, I don't know exactly what caused them to turn the tide. And now I think they've given him a raise, maybe because of public outcry. So, you know, you've got Brexit, then you've got Donald Trump. Then you've got this guy being overturned. Are we smelling a shift in the winds, uh, sir? I think so. And I, I and I, I, I like I go back to that when I was at Hostra, and I was just struck by I've never seen students vocal about anything that wasn't left wing. Like it's always left wing. So I thought, my God, maybe this is happening. And I know, and, I, and I've been invited to speak uh, at colleges. And, and when I do my book signings, there's a lot of kids out there. And they're, and they're like not, they're not, I, I think part of it is humor. That they now are, I think humor is the best way uh, to, to, to deal with this stuff. And I think they, they, it's like, why are we taking these people seriously? And I think that's the first step. No longer take them seriously. I do. I do think that parents. The one flaw in this: parents aren't keeping up on these schools. Like they're not doing the investigative uh, investigative work. Like what's happening on this campus? Do I want to send my kid to a brainwashing cult? Because that's what it is. And it, it's like, imagine you have a, a kid who leaves high school, straight A student, really smart, wants to, do, and all of a sudden he gets involved in these soft sciences that have no future. Whether it's, I don't know, whatever studies you can, like, like, Wh like women, what it does. women, but not spelled M-E-N, it's M-Y-N, right? Right. Well, I think, I think 
correct spelling is is a patriarchal construct. <laughs> very true, uh, very why true. should you tell me what is the correct spelling of the word when a man probably wrote that dictionary? Well, by the way, I feel the same way about that, math. That's why it's as wrong to correct somebody and it's racist if they're speaking in the dialect of Ebonics, right? Because you are yeah. saying that their manner of speaking is grammatically incorrect. That's racist. Isn't there a movement against math? I remember reading something about people saying activists on campus saying that like the absolutes of math yeah. are patriarchal sec and sexist. Like math, math is inherently sexist, right? So, which so is actually sexist against women when you say that because you're saying it's sexist against women. They're basically saying that women can't handle math because it's absolute. Well, Lawrence, have you seen this? Yes, I have. So, so it's. I mean. I'll give, I think I'll speak about the specific instance you're talking about, but I'll give you sort of the background of that kind of in, you know, inane stupidity. Uh, I think you're talking about science must fall. And it was yes. a, a bunch of social activists at uh, University of Cape Town who were, right. you know, very, very, you know, pro, post-apartheid. You know, right. Science is a Western way of thinking and so on. And you have to decolonize your mind, right? Yes. Uh, now, that idiocy actually stems from one of the quote intellectual movements that has infected western universities postmodernism right so mm -hmm. postmodernism is rightly referred to as an anti-science movement because it takes the central foundation of what science is which is there are regular patterns in nature that we try to humbly with humility understand as scientists as best as we can. And they say, no, that's a completely wasted effort because yeah. everything is subjective. Everybody has their own way of knowing. There is no privileged way of knowing as per the scientific method. So stop this, you racist Nazi. So that's what started all this. And right. for 40 years, you've been inoculating at UC Berkeley and other schools, kids with postmodernism. And then you end up with the science must fall. But the same right. people who say science must fall take a plane that is based on principles of aerodynamics to their conference to spew the bullshit that science must fall. Yeah. That irony, they miss it. Yeah, it's amazing. But it's, again, I go back to, I mean, it, there has to be an alternative to this. If this is, if campuses aren't gonna change, then there has to be, a, can't there be par a parallel universe of campuses <laughs> where you go, okay, you're not gonna have any of this deconstruction bullshit. You're not gonna have any of this postmodern crap. You're actually going to learn the humanities. You're going to learn a, a trade. I mean, wouldn't it, wh that's what that's what Peter Thiel and you know and, and people like should be thinking about. Like, uh, what's the alternative? I know he says don't go to college. Right. Well, you know, uh, he, I think I remember he was going to pay a hundred grand to students yes. not to go to not to go to school, which is is, a, is actually a pretty cool thing. I would have taken that definitely. <laughs> I probably would have ended up drunk somewhere like on an island and you never would have heard from me again. It wouldn't work for me. I need a discipline. Right. But uh, I think that like there has to be at some point another path because it's they're they're now indoctrinating students into a useless future. Right. Like what are they going to do? Well, what you know, you're no longer a productive member of society if all you do is file grievances. Well, the the bottom line is, I mean, education is of course to to learn something in terms of the knowledge base. You have to learn, if you're taking differential equations in, in, in a math program, you have to learn what differential equations is. But more generally, you just have to learn how to critically think, right? So independently of whether you use the humanities to achieve that goal or neurobiology, the idea is that there is a framework for reason, whether we call it the scientific method right. or use logic or use some other mechanism, you're teaching people how to critically think, irrespective of the discipline that they're in. So to, to speak to your point, any discipline that is an affront to reason and science is anti-intellectual, is fraudulent, and should be kicked out of the campuses. Yeah. Here's a funny story. When I was at Berkeley, I learned that I had to play the game, which was deconstruction. Oh, yes. So it didn't, it didn't matter what the author's intent was, you can apply a different intent. And I had my, my thesis was on Herman Melville. And so I, I did it. I just, I went to the library and I looked at it and I found all this deep this stuff on like the homoerotic themes of Herman <laughs> Melville. So I wrote my, I wrote my thesis on that. 
it was like it would have it, it should have gotten an A. But somehow I had the only professor who wouldn't buy that bullshit. He was an old school humanities professor. <laughs> he looked like a sailor. So I get my paper back expecting to sail through. And I think I got like a C minus. And I'm looking down and all he's writing in the margin is, you got to be kidding me. Come on. <laughs> I like this guy. I'd like to bring him on the show. Is he, is he still alive? He must he must have been okay. He was talking eighty three. He was probably in his sixties. Ah, so I don't okay. think he's around. Okay. But and I, I I always think about that. I was thinking about I should Google this dude because he saw right through me. He saw maybe he didn't know I was playing a game and he just thought that I believed it. But he was just like you're you're completely nuts. You know, and it was right because I wasn't using my mind. I wasn't. There's a professor who I think is retired now, and I I, I tried to reach out to him, but he's professor emeritus. He's also in his eighties. Uh, his name escapes me right now, but he's a professor of philosophy at Princeton who wrote a book, which if you haven't read, you need to go and buy it after we get off. Mm -hmm. On It's called, and this is a very highbrow guy, it's called On Bullshit, where he does a philosophical analysis of bullshit, bullshit in the grand sense, you know, all right. sorts of sort of cancerous, fraudulent yeah. movements and ideas. And I just thought, what a brilliant title. So anyways, check him out. Uh, are there any things that before, before we wrap up, any things that you're not that you need my small platform to promote your ideas, you sort of operate in a bigger platform, but can I offer you the small platform to promote anything that you're currently working on? That's not yet public. I would, um, I would just push everybody to try to watch my show, uh, which is on Fox. It's doing great. It's on at 10 PM East Eastern time, uh, Fox news. And, uh, there's my wife. Come here. Say hello, Elena. Oh, this is Elena. There she is. I can't see her. <laughs> Hi there. <laughs> Hi there. You got yourself you're in Quebec, a right. I'm sorry. You're, you're in Quebec, right? I am you're, in La Belle yeah. Province, Montreal, Quebec. Come up and see us. Yeah, we've always wanted to go, but uh, something, <laughs> something's kept me out of Canada. We won't get into that. Uh, but anyway, okay. yeah. <laughs> but uh, if, other, yeah, the, the show's doing good. Um, I'm gonna probably start writing another book, but I haven't figured out. Uh, I keep writing proposals. I don't know if you've done this. You write a proposal and then you're done. It's like, okay, that's out of my system. Right. I don't want to write the book. I wrote the proposal. And then and then my agent will go, okay, when are you going to start? I go, you know, I have another idea. Because I want to write – I actually want to write about artificial intelligence. Wow. But I don't think – I don't think I'm equipped to. Right. I don't think I have the mathematical science background to do it. But I'm, I've been – you know, I've read Bostrom's book. I've re I keep picking up books on this and I keep going – because I'm, politics is exhausting after a while and you make so many enemies amongst friends, I thought, do something totally different right? and and get out of that. But I, I realized maybe I'm just not – I'm not equipped for hard thoughts. <laughs> I'll just stick to politics. Well, listen, based on the spitfire speed at which you carry your show, uh, I think you're definitely not lacking IQ, sir. So I think keep up the great work. And it was an absolute pleasure so having you're you. You're in New York. You got to come and do the show. Please, um, thank you. Yeah, so we much. used to tape on Fridays and Saturdays, so uh, it'll be you know, a, it's a lot of fun. It'll be an honor. Thank you so much. Stay on the line, guys. Check sure. out Greg's uh, work on Fox. Talk to you soon. Thanks, Greg. You got it.